uh, we have some great cases and um, also uh, give enough time for uh, Dr. Piki to give his lecture. So I'd like to start by just doing the introduction. So uh, Dr. Francesco Piki graduated summa cum laude from the University of Bologna and went on to pursue an ophthalmology residency at the University of Milan. He underwent a preceptorship in uveitis and ocular immunology at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute, followed by a two-year fellowship in uveitis at the Cole Eye Institute at the Cleveland Clinic. Subsequently, he joined Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi, where he served as a retina and uveitis specialist for seven years, as well as ophthalmology program director for three years. He's an associate professor of ophthalmology at Case Western and has more than 170 peer-reviewed publications. He is widely recognized as a leader in uveitis and retina imaging uh, research with a particular uh, interest in multimodal imaging. We're very fortunate that he'll be joining our department at the University of Toronto next year and look forward to hearing his talk today entitled Syphilis, a Masquerade Ball. Uh, we'll begin with uh, some resident uh, presentations. And in terms of the format of, of the rounds, um, if anybody has any questions at any point, I'll be monitoring uh, the chat so that we could try to have this as interactive as possible and try to get uh, as pick Dr. Piquet's brain as much as possible about these cases. Thank you. So Sandra, if you could put up the slides, that'd be great. Samana, go ahead. I'm sorry, Moab, you're first, go ahead. Yeah. All right, now we start. Hello, I am Mohab, uh, Mohab Adib, one of the 50 year residents at the University of Toronto Department of Ophthalmology and Vision Sciences. And I'll be presenting today's grand rounds with uh, Dr. Picky. Um, so first I wanted to show our audience the um, fundus autofluorescence and macular OCT of the right eye of a 36 year old uh, male patient and the left eye of a 32 year old male patient. As you can see, the fundus autofluorescence of both patients has, uh, um, there are numerous uh, small hyperreflective lesions in the macular area and uh, peripheral retina with uh, ellipsoid zone disruption on OCT. Now I wanted to ask our audience, which one do they think is syphilis? the right eye of the 36-year-old male patient or the left eye of the 42-year-old uh, male patient? I'll just give a minute for responses. Second. See the results? Yeah. So the correct answer is the left eye of the 42-year-old male patient. But admittedly, the two pictures look almost identical to each other. Uh, the other eye was mute. And um, um, given like the great similarity between um, how syphilis presented here and uh, mute, uh, this is why uh, syphilis is called the great masquerader because of its ability to mimic um, other uh, uh, conditions. So now moving on uh, to our case, this was uh, this patient uh, was a 50-year-old female with, who was referred to our clinic with two-week history of flashes followed by deterioration of vision in the right eye that happened following um, an upper respiratory tract infection. Um, the presumed dia diagnosis of the referring physician was acute inner maculopathy, which is an uncommon uh, disease of retinal pigment epithelium that typically affects young uh, Caucasian adults. Um, it presents with a bullseye macular lesion with sudden severe unilateral vision loss um, following an, a, a flu-like illness. It typically recovers, however, almost completely within days to weeks. Our patients did not, our patient did not have a previous ocular history, was not using any drops at the time, was otherwise healthy and not using any medications and had no allergies. On examination, the best corrected visual acuity in the right eye was 2100 and in the left eye was 2050. The intraocular pressure was normal. Uh, there was no pupillary abnormality with no afferent pupillary defect. On slit lamp examination, the anterior segment examination was within normal limits with no evidence of anterior uveitis or arthritis. Uh, 
on the lipid fungus examination, there were uh, uh, white poliuretinal lesions in the macular area bilaterally. The optic disc was grossly normal. There was no evidence of vasculitis. In the periphery, there were numerous small um, uh, choriuretinal lesions. Uh, we ordered further office investigations such as fungus autofluorescence, macular OCT, fluorescein and geography, and endocyanin green uh, geography. The fungus autofluorescence revealed uh, uh, a sizable area of central macular hyperfluorescence with small wrist-like hyperfluorescent uh, uh, lesions in the retinal periphery in both eyes. The macular OCT revealed uh, some outer retinal atrophy with uh, ellipsoid zone and external limiting membrane disruption. Uh, there are hyperreflective areas of nodular thickening of the RPE that's more obvious uh, in the right eye. Uh, additionally, there were some choroidal hyperreflective spots. The fluorescein and geography showed um, a hot disk with uh, uh, small patchy areas of hyper and hypofluorescence in the macular region, more visible in the right eye with um, some subtle patch, uh, patchy hyperreflective areas uh, around the arcades. On uh, ICGA, there are no obvious abnormalities in the early phase. Uh, in the late phase, uh, there is an uh, area of hypocyanescence in the macula surrounded by hypercyanescence, which vaguely corresponds to the hyperreflective lesion in, in the macular area that uh, was seen in, on the fundus autofluorescence, but there is no clear correspondence of hyper or hypocyanescence with the peripheral lesions. Um, the fundus autofluorescence is in the bottom for the comparison. The ICGA of the left eye is similar to the right eye, but the patchy areas of hypo and hypercyanescence in the macula were slightly more obvious. Okay. Our differential diagnosis for this case included mutes, which was uh, among our top differentials. However, the bilaterality of uh, the presentation in our patient and our patient's older age were uh, atypical for mutes. Other differentials included azure, multifocal choroiditis, other white dot syndromes, but given the uh, atypical presentation, we kept in mind um, syphilis and other mutes like conditions such as lymphoma, ocular TB, um, ocular sarcoidosis, and cancer associated retinopathy. Um, we did an extensive review of, uh, of symptoms and ordered the standard uveitis workup, uh, including chest x-rays, angiotensin converting enzyme, uh, TB quantiferum gold, uh, which all came back negative. The cephalus RPR and FTA ABS were reactive, however, which made the diagnosis of acute cephalitic posterior placoid poriretinitis to be the most likely in, in this case. The patient was admitted and we started treatment with IV AQS crystalline penicillin G uh, for 14 days. At the five week follow up, uh, the patient's vision has recovered to 2025 in the right eye and 2020 in the left eye. Most of the hypofluorescent and hyperfluorescent spots uh, seen previously on the fundus autofluorescence were resolved with treatment. The outer retina has recovered with minimal disruption, still obvious in the ellipsoid zone on OCT. Now to review some of the literature on ocular syphilis and uh, uh, mutes. Mu uh, syphilis is a multi-system bacterial infection caused by spirochete treponema pallidum that can be transmitted sexually or from mother to fetus vertically through placenta during pregnancy or more rarely during delivery through an infected birth tract. Some of the risk factors include men who have sex with men, HIV infection, and unprotected sex. It's called the uh, great masquerader because of its ability to produce a myriad of signs and symptoms that may mimic various diseases given that it has a wide range of targets in the eye, including the conjunctiva, sclera, cornea, lens, uveal tract, retina, retinal vasculature, optic nerve, pupillo, uh, motor pathways, and cranial nerves. Eye involvement is believed to occur most often during the second and uh, secondary and tertiary stages of syphilis, although ocular manifestations have been reported in uh, all stages of the disease. The most common posterior segment findings include optic uh, nerve uh, involvement, 
such as papillitis, optic neuritis, or neuroretinitis, which can be present in around 87.5% of cases, followed by pan uh, uveitis, which can be present in 75% of cases, then uh, retinal vasculitis um, in around 72% of the cases, and acute syphilitic posterior placoid, uh, chloriditis or chloriretinitis in around 30% of cases, then chorioretinitis, macular edema, uh, serous retinal detachments, and necrotizing retinitis. Other presentations of syphilis can include episcleritis, scleritis, interstitial keratitis, non-granulomatous or granulomatous anterior uveitis. Considering it has uh, its wide range of presentations, syphilis should be included, uh, included or considered in the differential of any type of ocular inflammation, especially atypical ones, and should always be considered in the, in the workup. Acute syphilitic posterior placoid uh, pyoretinitis is a term, uh, term, term coined by Gass uh, and his team to describe a large yellowish uh, circular or oval placoid lesion at the level of the retinal pigment epithelium in or near the macula. The early phase of uh, fluorescein angiography typically shows hypofluorescence or faint hyperfluorescence, often with scattered hypofluorescence spots in the area corresponding to the yellowish opacification, a pattern referred by some, uh, to, by some as a leopard spotting. Mid and late phase uh, fluorescein angiography typically shows um, progressive hyperfluorescence corresponding to the area of the lesion. ICGA shows hypocyanesis corresponding to the lesion that persists into the late phase. However, in some patient, patients, late hype, uh, hypercyanescence in the affected area has also been described. Dr. Pichet and his team described uh, uh, the outer retinal abnormalities on SDOCT in patients with uh, uh, ASPPC, um, and these include uh, ISOS uh, junction disruption, nodular thickening of the RPE with loss of linear outer segment RPE junction, loss of uh, external limiting membrane, uh, subretinal fluid, and choroidal hyperreflectivity. Now, just to review some of the things on uh, MUTES. MUTES is principally a disease of the photoreceptors with unilateral acute disruption of the outer segment and the ellipsoid zone of young, otherwise healthy women uh, causing mild to moderate uh, visual symptoms. Typically characterized by multiple grayish white outer retinal spots on fundoscopy that are hyper reflected on uh, fundus autofluorescence with areas of ellipsoid zone disruption of OCT. The lesions appear hyperfluorescent on FA and hypocyanescent in the late phase of ICGA, corresponding to the lesions uh, seen on fundoscopy. The ellipsoid zone is re restored during recovery in nearly 100% of the cases, and no abnormalities are seen in the outer uh, nuclear layer or the RPE during follow-up. Uh, however, there are uh, conditions that can masquerade uh, mutes, known as the mutes-like uh, presentations, including syphilis, uh, lymphoma, and um, other white dot syndromes, such as uh, azure or multifocal choroiditis, ocular uh, sarcoid, uh, tuberculosis, and cancer-associated uh, retinopathy. Uh, the most common uh, uh, mutes-like condition is syphilis, followed by PVRL, uh, and that was uh, described in a case series by Rus uh, Russell et al. The typical features of uh, mutes include um, uh, demographics, and past medical history of immunosuppression or malignancy, the bilaterality of the presentation, presence of anterior chamber or vitreous cells, which is usually mild or absent in mutes, and lack of spontaneous improvement uh, are, should all be features that warrant suspicion for a diagnosis other than mutes. Also, multimodal imaging findings can reveal characteristics that are not consistent with mutes, including retinal vascular leakage and leopard spotting with uh, fluorescein angiography and lack of uh, hypocyanescence corresponding to the uh, grayish white spots and on I with ICGA. Um, OCT and angiography can also be useful in distinguishing mutes and mutes-like conditions. In our case, the atypical presentation was that this occurred in a previously healthy middle-aged uh, woman. Uh, the bilaterality and the lack of hypocyanescence corresponding to the uh, peripheral uh, grayish white spots on ICGA 
high index of suspicion must be maintained for masqueraders of nudes and further workup might, uh, may be necessary to identify masqueraders of nudes um, that can cause serious uh, uh, inflammatory, infectious, and new plastic disorders. Um, that can often uh, res uh, respond favorably to interventional treatment. So some to take uh, home points is um, uh, syphilis is a great masquerader and uh, its posterior segment presentation can be very variable and uh, mimic conditions such as nudes. Multimodal imaging uh, can be helpful in diagnosing uh, AS uh, PPC. A typical presentation of nudes uh, should warrant further investigation to rule out um, uh, nudes-like conditions. Early diagnosis and treatment is critical in um, site, uh, in preventing uh, site-threatening consequences of syphilis. Right, and thank you very much. That was a fantastic presentation, uh, Mohab. I just have a question uh, for Dr. Peaky, which is, um, what is your protocol in terms of using oral corticosteroids uh, concurrently with um, IV penicillin in these cases of posterior placoid syphilis? Um, so like with other infection, for example, in TB, I always wait a couple of days at least for the antibiotics to kick in. So, and it also depends on the amount of, uh, uh vitritis the patient have, because if I want to treat, uh, uh, this patient in particular, uh, I don't think I gave any steroids. Uh, she recovered perfectly well just with the IV penicillin. Um, but if there's a, a lot of uh, reaction, like in the vitreous or anterior chamber, and I'm worried that it's going to leave some uh, long-standing strands and impact the vision, then I use corticosteroids in these cases. And I wait a couple of days just uh, to have the, the good antibiotic coverage. And I, I actually see in the in the chat that Dr. Miguel commented the uh, pyramidal, yes, the pyramidal deposits on OCT. I like the word pyramidal a lot. We should have used that probably. If it's just the nodularities of the RPE, I have um, in the few slides I have at the end, we will touch upon those. Uh, this is, uh, it was uh, quite an atypical case of the placoid form of syphilis uh, that was masquerading as, uh, as, as mutes. So if there's any questions, happy to discuss. Francisco, this is usually, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but would this be tertiary syphilis? And we should we be treating these patients in conjunction with our colleagues in the STD clinic to, to treat other possible manifestations? So uh, that's a great question. And it's always difficult for, uh, for us to understand if it's secondary or tertiary. But what we know is that if it involves the eye, it's considered neurosyphilis. So um, I always have uh, these long conversations with infectious disease colleagues that they want they don't want to admit the patient and give IV penicillin. I need to explain to them that this is neurosyphilis because it's involved in the eye. Um, so um, yes, the patient should be worked up. Uh, there's also the question, should the patient get a, a lumbar puncture or not? Um, I usually leave it to the infectious disease specialist uh, if the nerve is involved. Like this patient had a bit of a hot nerve. Sometimes you have a frank neuroretinitis. In that case, I always suggest uh, uh, the LP for these patients. Um, but yes, it's, it's impossible for me to tell if it's secondary or tertiary. It's usually more uh, towards the secondary. Uh, but the important thing is to consider it neurosyphilis. Thank you. <clears throat> Okay, that's great. So we'll uh, go ahead with our second resident presentation. Sandra, if you could just pull up that slide. Love, do a self share. Right. I'm going to see my now. Perfect. Okay, I'll pull up my slides. Okay, hi everyone. It's nice to meet you. My name is Samantha. I'm one of the PGY2 residents here in Toronto, and I'll be presenting another uh, atypical case of syphilis. Uh, and thank you so much, Dr. Peaky, for providing the cases and for helping us uh, create the slides as well. Uh, the objectives of today is to uh, review the clinical history and multimodal imaging findings of a case of atypical ocular syphilis, discuss the differential diagnosis for ocular syphilis, and then also discuss current investigation and treatment options uh, for ocular syphilis. <clears throat> 
So we're gonna go into our first poll as well, very similar to Mohab's. We have two cases, a 48 year old male with an area of retinal whitening in the posterior pole and a 52 year old male with an area, many areas of retinal whitening and hemorrhage in the posterior pole. And their OCTs are included below as well. And we're going to ask the audience, which one do you think is syphilis? more seconds here. <laughs> and, and a lot for the end. Okay, it was 50-50. So let's see which one the answer was. The winner was the second patient, the patient with lots of retinal whitening and hemorrhage in the posterior pole. So to get into the case presentation, this is a 52-year-old man who presented to clinic with a rapidly progressive vision loss and redness in the left eye for about 20 days. Only notable past medical history was a cardiac transplant for which he's on cyclosporin and mycophenolate. Otherwise, no ocular history, no other drops. On anterior segment exam, uh, we can see the vision in the left eye is light perception. Pressures were fine. Pupil was fine. This is a slit lamp picture of the anterior segment. And I don't know if it's very obvious, but we can see endothelial dusting. There's cell and flare in the anterior chamber, and there's a very mild cataract. On posterior segment examination, we can see areas of necrotizing and hemorrhagic retinitis all within the posterior pole. And in the periphery, we can see areas of uh, vasculitis. And then all over, there's vitritis as well. On multimodal imaging, a swept source OCT was taken. And the key features that we can see are full thickness retinal hyperreflectivity associated with thickening of the retina, indicating full thickness retinal ischemia, and then also lots of vitritis. IVFA was obtained, and we can see there's a very, very hot disc. It's quite swollen. There's lots of ischemic vasculitis, and then there's lots of leakage, masking effect, window effect. So if we think about and just kind of review the key features of the case so far, we have a 52-year-old immune-suppressed patient with unilateral panuveitis, areas of retinal whitening and hemorrhage in the posterior pole, full thickness, hyperreflectivity on OCT, and vasculitis seen on IVFA. So usually if we put all these features together, our first thought is that this patient has a viral retinitis. And so moving forward in this patient's case, he was admitted to the hospital uh, for further, investi further investigation, sorry, including an AC tap for viruses and blood work for viruses, toxo, and syphilis. Uh, IV plus carnet was started and intravitreal gancyclovir was given. On day one of admission, his PCR came back negative for viruses. The rest of the investigations were pending, but the patient was starting to get worse. So a uh, discussion was had and the decision was made to undergo a diagnostic vitrectomy and give um, uh, IV clindamycin, sorry. So vitrectomy was undergone. Post vitrectomy, we can still, we can see kind of a little bit beyond some of the vitritis now. So we can see there's optic disc swelling. We can see some of the ghost vessels in the posterior pole, retinal atrophy in the periphery. There's still areas of hemorrhages and there's oil as well. Vitreous biopsy results come back. The PCR is negative for viruses but the serology is positive for syphilis. And so this was a very atypical case of ocular syphilis, and we'll talk a little bit more about it. The patient was started on PEN-G, and things look similar, but better. So there's less cyst swelling, there's still leakage, but it's not as worse as it was at the beginning. And then there's all these areas of RP atrophy from uh, the syphilis, which has affected those areas. So going into syphilis, Mohab covered a little bit about this. I'll cover a little bit more about the staging and the investigations. Uh, syphilis, as Mohab talked about, is a sexually or congenitally acquired bacterial infectious disease that's caused by Trepanema pallidum. Uh, in Canada specifically, actually syphilis is really on the rise. So syphilis has increased from 5.1 cases per 100,000 people in 2011 to 24.7 cases per 100,000 people in 2020. And the rates among men have increased by 73%. But in this paper, they cited that the rates among women have increased by 773%. So it's not only a disease that we see mostly in men or mostly in men who have sex with men, um, women should also be considered on the syphilis differential as well. Uh, syphilis occurs in many different stages that are classified by their symptoms and timings since infection. And the reason that it's very important to classify people properly is that it affects the type of treatment that you get. So early syphilis is um, classified as within one year of infection, and that includes the subgroups of primary, secondary, and early latent syphilis. Tertiary syphilis is more than one year after primary infection. 
Latent syphilis is when you have an asymptomatic infection, but you have reactive serologic findings. And then neurosyphilis is any infection of the central nervous system, including the eye, by Treponema pallidum. JAMA had a really good review paper on syphilis, and they go into all the staging, the classifications, and the treatment algorithm uh, for each type of syphilis. Ocular syphilis is defined by the CDC as any clinical symptoms or signs consistent with ocular disease with syphilis at any stage. So it's a very broad definition, and it basically includes like any ocular inflammation with a patient who's syphilis positive could be ocular syphilis. Um, it's mostly occurring in men during the fifth decade of life. It's most common in Caucasian people, and there's a very high rate of HIV co-infection. So that's something that you should probably also be testing patients for if you feel like they have a very high pretest probability of having HIV co-infection. Um, as Mohab went through, um, ocular syphilis can affect any ocular structure and should be included in your investigation for any type of ocular inflammation. Um, so it can affect the anterior segment, posterior segment, and there's many different uveitic manifestations uh, for ocular syphilis. And one of the ones that Dr. Peaky investigated and reported on in the literature is the acute syphilitic posterior placoid corneal retinitis. In terms of the mimickers of ocular syphilis, and we'll have kind of went into this too, it can mimic pretty much anything, but some of the interesting mimickers include the white dot diseases, um, and then also pigmentary diseases like retinitis pigmentosa, and then pigmentary parabenous um, retinochoroid atrophy was another a third case that Dr. Peaky had that was an ocular syphilis mimicker as well. Going into the investigation, so this is something that we order in our clinic all the time, and there are pros and cons to ordering the types of investigations. And the two types that we'll order, because you can't actually culture treponema pallidum itself, are non-treponemal tests and treponemal tests. The difference between the two is that non-treponemal tests looks at biomarkers of active syphilis, while treponemal detects antibodies to treponema pallidum antigens themselves. Common non-treponemal tests include VDR, VDRL and RPR, and then treponemal are the FTA ABS testings. In terms of the pros and cons, for non-treponemal tests, it's useful to monitor treatment response, and actually you should probably only be using non-treponemal tests to monitor treatment response. Uh, VDRL will be the type of testing that's probably most used if you get a lumbar puncture and test CSF for syphilis. Um, and VDRL, RPR, they're positive very early in syphilis, so they can actually detect primary syphilis. Um, the only con is that if you have late secondary tertiary syphilis, those tests might be negative. In terms of the treponemal tests, the pros are that they're positive from secondary syphilis, but then the con of that is that once they're positive, they're positive for life, so they're not very good to monitor treatment response. And then uh, they're also very cost effective, which is great, but then if you're looking at a patient that you think might have primary syphilis, it might yield a negative result at the beginning. The traditional algorithm for testing for syphilis includes going to, for a non-treponemal test first and then a treponemal test second. Uh, the reverse algorithm is the other way around. Uh, it's a lot cheaper. Um, it can detect any sort of previous treatment that the patient had, but we would only probably recommend using it in low prevalence populations. Um, and we have two tables here for the sensitivity and specificity of non-treponemal and treponemal tests and all the different kind of stages of syphilis. Uh, regarding CSF testing, the standard test for CSF is VDRL, as we mentioned before. It's very specific. Um, it doesn't have the greatest sensitivity, but it is very specific for syphilis. Uh, RPR in CSF samples, if you send that, can have a very high false negative rate. Um, and FTA ABS in the CSF is very sensitive, but it's not very specific. So the negative predictive value of the test is dependent on the specificity and the prevalence, so how likely you think the patient is to have neurosyphilis. So if a patient, you send it for CSF, FTA, ABS, and it's negative, that doesn't necessarily mean they don't have neurosyphilis if you think there's a very high likelihood that this patient has um, a neurosyphilis. Regarding the treatment, so as Dr. Peaky mentioned, ocular syphilis is treated as neurosyphilis. The first line therapy option for these patients is PEN-G at 18 to 24 million units IV daily, and it can be given as three to four million units every hour or every four hours, sorry, for 10 to 14 days. Um, if the patient for some reason cannot be admitted or IV penicillin is impossible to administer, uh, you can give IV ceftriaxone one to two grams daily for 10 to 14 days, or you can give a different form of penicillin as an intramuscular with proben probenicid, 500 milligrams four times daily, all of it for 10 to 14 days.
If a patient has a penicillin allergy, uh, this would be a time where you'd actually want to undergo desensitization to penicillin so that you could give them the best treatment option. Um, and you can also give systemic steroids in this case. Uh, uh, but there is one reaction to talk about in terms of syphilis and syphilis treatment, and that's a jarish herxheimer reaction. So one small piece about that. The jarish herxheimer reaction is a transient clinical phenomenon which occurs in patients infected by spirochetes who receive antibiotic treatment. And so trepanema pallidum is a spirochete and syphilis is actually the leading spirochetal infection that will cause this reaction. It usually happens pretty soon after the onset of antibiotics and it can look either like an anaphylactic or a septic reaction. So it can present as fever, chills, rigors, nausea, hypotension, um, vomiting, headache, et cetera. Uh, and it has a whole spectrum from not really requiring anything to sometimes patients require hospital admission just for supportive care. The important thing to note is that it is a self-limiting condition. So unlike anaphylaxis or sepsis, this usually gets better on its own. It's just something to counsel patients about so that they're watching out for their own symptoms and something for you to know about as a clinician as well. And the pathophysiology is on the right-hand side. Uh, it's just thought to be a, a lot of increase or upregulation of inflammatory mediators uh, in response to the antibiotic treatment. Regarding the prognosis, all the papers and all the literature on syphilis and ocular syphilis have noted that if a patient receives appropriate treatment in the form of IV penicillin, they actually tend to do quite well. So one paper cited a 97% improvement or achievement of a normal visual acuity in response to treatment. And another paper said that 92% of patients had a vision better than 2040 at final follow-up. And they'd follow 63 eyes for two years, which was one of the longest um, kind of time period follow-up for a cohort study in this paper. And they also found no difference in patients who presented early or late, and the mean time was about one month, and also no difference in patients who had HIV co-infection. They just emphasized that the main factor for doing well in these patients is appropriate treatment, so that they're treated with IV penicillin in a very appropriate timeline. Take home points from this presentation. As we've seen, syphilis can present as ocular inflammation involving any structure of the eye. And it's very important to keep on your differential, particularly in patients who aren't responding the way that you think they should be responding to your treatment. Multimodal imaging is extremely helpful in distinguishing manifestations of syphilis um, from other masqueraders. And ocular syphilis should be treated like neurosyphilis with IV pen G, plus or minus steroids with the guidance of a uveitis specialist and um, infectious diseases team. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, Sumana. So uh, that's, uh, this case was uh, a bit crazy for me because the patient was very immunosuppressed. So I'm sure what Panos thought when he saw the picture, it's uh, this is viral, uh, like some CMV retinitis because there's a lot of hemorrhages. Um, so if uh, for residents, one of the most important teaching that I had during my fellowship is that you should treat the patient for whatever can blind the patient. So that's why we went straight for Foscarnet and uh, uh, Gancyclovir and then uh, some Clinda during uh, the, the vitrectomy to cover for toxo. And this is one of those uh, examples when uh, the lab work is not coming back and you're, you keep refreshing, refreshing, and, uh, and then it turned out to be syphilis. And of course, you treat the patient, but the vision for the vision is a, was a bit too late. Um, yes, so any questions about this case in particular? Or comments? Did, did this patient did this patient end up having uh, HIV? Uh, no, uh, it was just uh, uh, strongly immunosuppressed with the uh, mycophenolate and uh, I think it was uh, tacrolimus or uh, cyclosporin. So it was a matter of just being immunosuppressed from uh, medically because uh, because of the transplant. Okay. Francisco, no were there any corneal findings uh, with the either of the two patients? I'm sorry, can you repeat the question? Were there any corneal findings, specifically interstitial keratitis, with uh, either of those two patients? No, no, just uh, some endothelial, uh, cap uh, some KPs dusting. or endothelial dusting. Mm. 
I want to ask about uh, unilateral versus bilateral um, syphilis, uh, ocular syphilis. How often do you find, uh, um, uh, in your experience, how often is uh, syphilis presenting uh, unilaterally um, and how often is it bilateral? Mm -hmm. That's a great question. I don't think I have uh, an answer here. I think most of the time uh, I see it unilateral. Um, it's only very rarely bilateral, uh, just where I practice. Um, when I was in Cleveland, which is uh, like uh, the second hub for syphilis in the US, uh, you see a bit of everything. So I don't think we can uh, uh, we can just say bilateral or unilateral. You know, when, when the, the first case that was a MUDES masquerade, the MUDES, it's usually unilateral. So if you see it bilateral, uh, just suspect it's a, a weird form of MUDES or something else is ongoing. But with infections, it's uh, very difficult because there's a lot of confounders. Like the second patient was immunosuppressed, but it was only in one eye. You find Thank that you. the posterior placoids tend to be more likely bilateral. I think almost all the posterior placoids, except one I, I've seen, have been bilateral. Yeah, when we published the series, I think it was mostly bilateral. Uh, some can be unilateral but uh, or uh, asymmetric. So you have an eye with a beautiful plaque and an eye with uh, some, like, it's a weird plaque. It doesn't, doesn't have the typical, the typical appearance uh, of the plaque. But yes, but I think it's mostly uh, bilateral, the placoid form. Okay, so if you don't have any other questions or comments, I'll just uh, do like 10 minutes uh, on uh, uh, if, uh, so we, we saw um, that the point of uh, these cases was to show you that syphilis can masquerade as everything. As Sumana pointed out, the third case I sent to them uh, just to pick was uh, a, a form of syphilis that uh, um, manifested sort of like a paravenous atrophy. So um, can we use imaging to un unmask syphilis? Well, uh, at this point after this presentation, the answer should be no, and then I should just stop sharing my screen. But in uh, my practice, uh, even if syphilis can be the great masquerade. Uh, I'm a person who looks for pattern in everything. And um, I'm gonna just uh, briefly talk about um, how we can group uh, the typical, let's call them posterior manifestation of syphilis into uh, these following groups. So these are uh, the appearances of syphilis that uh, can be considered typical, even if nothing is typical about syphilis uh, uh, in the posterior segment. So you have the superficial retinal precipitates here. You have the multifocal retinitis, and we will see this is mostly something that I've never seen is mostly if you misdiagnose and treat the patient with steroids. Then you have the retinochoroiditis or chororetinitis, whatever you want to call it. I think the uh, spirochetes are coming through the choroid, so it should be chororetinitis, which couldn't be confluent or placoid. And then the form uh, with, that affects mostly the nerve papillitis or neuroretinitis. So starting with a superficial retinal precipitate, this is a, a fundus picture of... Um, an HIV positive patient uh, whose CD4 count was over 200, PCR negative for all the viruses and RPR positive. And you can see in uh, the area of uh, whitening, well, straight away you can see that um, compared to a normal, uh, a normal compared to a, a viral retinitis, for example, which has this chalk white appearance, this uh, area of retinitis has kind of a ground glass appearance. And there are some deposits on top, on top of the retina and on top of the hyoid here. So these deposits are quite typical of infections. They can be associated with toxo or associated with syphilis. Uh, they were first described by Emmett uh, and, uh, and his group, and uh, they, they are mostly uh, inflammatory cells that precipitates. So if you uh, speak to Emmett, uh, he said that he would call them accumulation if he had to do um, things from scratch because nothing is actually precipitating, but we're stuck with the name precipitates. So if you want, they're kind of the equivalent of keratic precipitates in the cornea, they're precipitates on uh, the retina. They're not typical just for syphilis, but they should point towards an infection, whether it's syphilis, toxo, very common in toxin as well. Now, the multifocal retinitis is something I've never seen. The lesions are intraretinal. So it's kind of like a full thickness retinitis um, that has a multifocal appearance, uh, dot-like appearance. 
It's always reported after the use of systemic or intravitreal corticosteroids in the absence of uh, uh, antibiotic treatment. It was, um, it's only reported in few papers in the literature. Uh, one was by the Andre Curry group with Saraf as well. I think they were the first one to, uh, to report it. And you can see it has this particular uh, uh, multifocal dot-like appearance uh, uh, and the lesions are involving either the inner retina or the full thickness and they mask behind. Something again that's probably we shouldn't be seeing because we should never put an ozordex or treat a patient with steroids without proper, properly excluding an infection. Now, the most common form that you may encounter of syphilis, uh, it's uh, retinochoroiditis. Like we've seen, uh, for example, in the first patient, um, the first patient had uh, a, a placoid retinitis or retinochoroiditis. It uh, involves the retina more than choroid, but it's coming through the choroid. That's why in the placoid form, uh, you see the plaque at the level of the uh, macula because the choroidal flow at the level of the macula is the greatest. Now, this retinal choroiditis, uh, you have the confluent with an F uh, form and the placoid form. The confluent form is quite um, typical. As I was saying before, it has this ground glass appearance. So it's not chalky white. It has often this uh, triangular appearance and uh, the retinitis, again, it's not so dense as in viral retinitis or in, or in toxo. It is associated with vasculitis and with this accumulation, the precipitates that we've seen before. There's also a denser form. So as to show you that syphilis can masquerade as everything, there's a denser form of confluent retinochoroiditis. This is actually a patient... Uh, I'd have seen some times ago, and he had uh, uh, he came to me with scleritis, uh, nodular scleritis, uh, and corresponding to the nodule of scleritis, there was this area of retinitis, and it turned out to be syphilis. Most of the time, you're going to see this uh, particular uh, form, a ground glass appearance. So the retinitis, again, is not dense. You can see the details of the retina and the cord underneath very well. You have uh, this particular triangular shape. Please don't ask me why it has this uh, triangular shape, because I have no clue. Um, and uh, in FA, there's usually vasculitis and hyperfluorescence of the margins, hot disk as well here. And you have the superficial uh, uh, retinal deposits or accumulation. Now, one uh, of the form that's most intriguing is the placoid form of uh, chororetinitis. This patient has one of the huge, the, the, like the biggest the plaque of uh, uh, chororetinitis that I've seen. And uh, you can see it's hyperautofluorescence, like in the first patient that we have seen with the, some uh, dot-like lesions here. On uh, the OCT uh, can be considered quite uh, uh, diagnostic, if you want, quite telltale, because it has this nodular RPE uh, changes that go away with the proper treatment. So this is what's called uh, by what was called by gas uh, ASPPC, acute syphilitic posterior placoid chororetinitis. It's just the uh, placoid form, um, which manifests as a white plaque at the level of the macula. Again, why at the level of the macula? Because the spirochetes are probably coming through the choroid and the choroidal flow is the biggest at the macula. On autofluorescence, uh, the RP nodularities, they are hyper, and you can see them here, and the whole plaque is uh, uh, slightly hyper. On uh, uh, FA, it uh, stains a bit and then it leaks uh, uh, late, the plaque. And on ICG, it's hypo. So um, we saw it already when Mob presented the first case, we saw that ICG was hypo. So this is again telling us that probably the choroid is the primary site of infection and there's an alteration of the choroidal flow. And then the spirochetes are affecting the RPE and, uh, and then the, the outer retina. Uh, this is the appearance. Uh, when uh, we published the series, we saw that if you see the patient very, very early from uh, the uh, infection and from the decrease in vision, uh, you find that the patient has some subretinal fluid. This goes away spontaneously. And so if you don't pick it up, you're usually seeing this. These are the nodularities of the RP, the par uh, pyramidal, yes, uh, that Dr. Miguel mentioned. So um, uh, there are nodularities of the RPE that are hyper in autofluorescence. At this point, you need to do a diagnosis, treat the patient correctly, and you have a complete restoration of the RPE and with it of the photoreceptors.
So the photoreceptors are indeed affected uh, at this point. They're probably a bit attenuated. That's why we have this hyper autofluorescence of the whole plaque because you are seeing more of the underlying RP because the photoreceptor are uh, attenuated and probably bent or uh, or something. So we need to treat the patient before the photoreceptors are uh, permanently affected. So uh, and that's the the final result if the patient is properly treated. Now, finally, uh, the papillitis or neuroretinitis. Uh, whenever you have uh, a papillitis, you need to suspect anything in uveitis. It can be any kind of infection. I've seen ARN start like this. I've seen uh, syphilis. I've seen toxo. I've seen everything. But one it should be actually syphilis. It, uh, and then um, you should always exclude it. And if the patient is positive, then... That's when I push, as I was saying, I push the ID doctor uh, um, and the neurologist to do an LP and uh, uh, check the uh, VDRL in the CSF as well. Um, and that's it from my side in terms of uh, imaging uh, uh, in syphilis. I'm happy to take any questions or comments. I just have a, a question just about these uh, acute posterior syphilitic ones. I, I've seen a few cases that are similar to your mutes um, that masquerade as Azor. And I'm just wondering whether these are all just kind of spectrums of the same disease, but you're just catching them a bit earlier. Um, and the reason why I say that is because I saw a patient where on one eye, it looked like Azor. There was no plaque, but there was quite a bit of, of kind of ellipsoid zone loss. And uh, no nodules quite yet, but the other eye had a placoid lesion. So I'm just wondering whether this is kind of a temporal course where you're just seeing them earlier in the presentation before they get that kind of infiltrative plaque. Uh, it could be. It's difficult to say. Um, it, we were talking about it before. So the placoid form is mostly bilateral, but sometimes uh, asymmetrical. So um, it's uh, since the spirochetes are coming through the choroid, uh, we have the plaque in the center. So I'm not sure if we can consider it part, part of the spectrum, but patients are allowed to have a different manifestation of syphilis in uh, uh, for each eye. So uh, whether it's part of the spectrum or not, as long as you make the correct diagnosis and try to save those photoreceptors, uh, you're fine and doing your job. Uh, and Unfortunately, yes, syphilis can masquerade as everything. Mutes can masquerade as everything. So whenever you have a patient with mutes, like keep an, uh, an open mind uh, because we all like we, there's a, there's primary mutes, there's secondary mutes where you have done something to the patient and you created the mutes. And then finally, there is a mutes masquerades and syphilis can be a mutes masquerade. Hi, I want to ask you just to go back to the uh, prednisone again that you had discussed. Um, have you used uh, prednisone um, to treat the or prevent the jerks Herzheimer reaction um, in a situation where there's a severe syphilis? Um, I mean, like a, a lot of vitritis already um, that uh, is being um, uh, treated. Do you um, sometimes start the steroids earlier to prevent the reaction? So I never use them to prevent. Uh, I think that's something that infectious disease colleagues should uh, do if mm -hmm. they feel comfortable, but I don't feel comfortable enough to use them to prevent. Of course, if the patient starts with a reaction, then yes, you start the steroids as soon as you see something. Usually at that point, it's a, a multi-team multi, multi -team, uh, approach to the, to the patient, uh, but I've never used them uh, uh, to prevent. I would be, I don't know, I'm a bit scared of, uh, in these cases, of using corticosteroids without the proper coverage. Yeah, no, so I did, yeah, so I meant to say after you, right, so after you started treating with the uh, appropriate uh, antimicrobial, for the, with the, after you started with penicillin, so I, I have had a case before where uh, the infectious disease colleague did uh, recommend starting the, um, uh, well, we had discussion, we started the prednisone a little earlier uh, for that reason. Um, cause we were yeah. expecting there could be a reaction. It was a bilateral, uh, pan uh, with, uh, papillitis as well. So we did go ahead and start the prednisone earlier. Yeah, that should, uh, so I, as a, yeah, I agree. It should come from the infectious disease, the recommendation, cause I don't think we know enough, uh, uh, to be able to recommend it, but yes, as long as you do at least one day or two of coverage with antibiotic, I'm, I'm comfortable. And I usually recommend it myself, mm -hmm. even if I'm not scared about the reaction, I recommend it for, cases with a lot of vitritis.
Right. And I think it's a similar concept. So if we're treating toxo or we're treating TB, then again, it's when do we, uh, I, I do the same thing. I, I, I wait with the prednisone until mm. uh, we've had some treatment. And uh, yes, often the ID colleagues will say two days. Sometimes I wait longer before I start the prednisone. Um, yeah, TB, I want to TB also- is more sorry. forgiving. TB is more forgiving. So even if you misdiagnose it uh, and you start steroids, I've rarely seen a patient go blind from that. Of course, we should be very careful and not misdiagnose it, but TB is forgiving. Toxo, viral, and syphilis, uh, not very right. forgiving. Right. Yeah. So you definitely need that coverage before you start. Mm. Um, and then how well, much you... prednisone do you use if you're choosing, if you're deciding to start the prednisone because you want to get rid of the inflammatory reaction? So I usually treat the, the usual uh, boring uh, one milligram per kilo and I never go over 60. Uh, so the new uh, rheumatology guidelines, they say that we should never go over 60 and I follow them. Uh, I can also use 0 0.5. If it's just a mild mm. inflammatory reaction, I can also use 0 0.5 and tailor it depending on uh, does the patient have diabetes, uh, age of the patient, uh, comorbidities. So based on all mm -hmm. this thing, I think it's uh, it's very uh, depends on the subject you have in front of you. I'll make one more comment. I was going to, we were talking about the uh, different uh, uh, testing that we do. And uh, here in Ontario, we do the CMIA. It's the chemoluminescent uh, uh, assay. It's, like, it's an um, uh, antibody test uh, for syphilis. It measures the IgM as well as the IgG. So I know classically we talk about I, uh, the FTABS, MHATP, but uh, here we do the CMIA. If the CMIA is positive, so if that antibody syphilitic test is positive, then they'll do the uh, the RPR, I think now, uh, or the VDRL. So you're basically using the reverse algorithm, which is, uh, yes. I think it's just uh, cheaper. It depends on uh, institution. When I left, when I started in Cleveland, they were using the normal algorithm and then they shifted to the reverse uh, when I left. So they test the uh, uh, syphilis IgG first and then they confirm with RPR. Uh, I think it depends where you practice uh, and uh, also like uh, cost effectiveness of uh, of your testing. Yeah. Right. I just have a question for you, Francesco, about in terms of which uh, patients uh, you order syphilis testing on in terms of uveitis. Um, every time we have a ground rounds of this, the uh, the amount of syphilis test spikes. People start ordering it kind of on every every patient with uveitis, including anterior uveitis. And I'm just wondering whether you have any kind of guidance in terms of what patients uh, you order it on. Well, you know, the, tr the, the usual teaching is we should uh, always order, we should always rule out circuit TB and syphilis because they can present ev as everything. But of course, if you have a patient with the, uh, acute anterior uveitis first episode, it's not even worth investigating. It's something I don't even do. Um, Scleritis patients very, very rarely I order um, syphilis, uh, only if they're not responding or something is very weird or there's something in the back of the eye as well. Now, if we move to intermediate uveitis or uh, posterior or panuveitis, then I order a bit more. Um, I have to be honest, if it's only limited to the anterior segment, uh, I quite never order it unless there's uh, something weird and the patient is not responding correctly. What's your approach? Very similar to yours. So for mm -hmm. anterior, unless there's mutton fat KPs, bilateral involvement, or a patient that has uh, risk factors for syphilis, I tend not to order it. Anything posterior, I'll order it in, in everybody. And the reason mostly actually is because these people oftentimes go on systemic immunosuppression and it's good to rule out um, any type of infection because they may not have any ocular involvement. It may be unrelated uh, but they may have uh, latent syphilis um, uh, mm -hmm. as well. So if they're going to be any patient that's going to be on oral prednisone, um, I tend to like to rule out syphilis prior to initiating. Yeah. I think in the grand scheme of things, it's it's probably quite a low cost uh, test. I mean, we see people like, you know, ordering things like Lyme disease and that, are, which are way, way more low yield Um in terms of uh, of likelihood, but uh, you know we we always try and balance 
cost effectiveness of testing and that and being kind of good stewards of healthcare. But when a patient, like you said, has vision threatening disease, like I, I have a case almost identical to your case with the retinitis. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought, just like you, I thought it was, uh, you know, viral, just given the appearance um, and uh, ordered all the testing. And sure enough, it came back positive for syphilis and that could potentially save the patient's vision. So I think your threshold to order testing when something's visually threatening, you know, and or potentially life threatening is 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 lower. So uh, yeah. I, these patients with these diseases, I tend to order syphilis on uh, all of them, uh, even if they have a posterior manifestation that might be more consistent with another another disease. You have a patient that comes in with kind of a classic serpiginous light. Do you order syphilis testing uh, or do you just order TB testing and that? I, I tend to order syphilis testing on these patients just because one, they'll be started on systemic immunosuppression. And secondary, it's, you know, it's potentially vision threatening. Yeah, absolutely. Have you guys seen an increase in the number of syphilis cases over the last decade? Uh, surprisingly, you know, when I came here, there was basically no syphilis and then it started, uh, increasing uh, quite a bit here in the UAE. So it wasn't me, but it's just because, uh, it's, uh, a, a place where, uh, it's basically a hub to go to the East, to the West. So there's a lot of tourists, a uh, lot of people, uh, stopping by. We have, uh, any kind of weird thing like, uh, West Nile as well. Uh, sometimes it spikes. So, uh, yes, there's been an increase. Definitely. Well, thank you for that amazing talk, those great cases, and especially those great uh, images that uh, that you had. Um, just to let everybody else know if there are no other questions, uh, next week we will not be having Grand Rounds because of the American Academy, uh, but we'll resume the following week. Thank you very much for inviting me. And we're especially excited when you come here and you can uh, help us out Absolutely. too with our cases. <laughs> uh, hopefully it doesn't spike safely as well there when I join. Otherwise, there's a pattern. Great thank you, everyone. Let's go. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.